Okay, let's start the second chapter, portfolio management. We start this portfolio management chapter with prop trading on wholesale markets. We have three subchapters within prop trading. We start with explaining markets and products. Then we explain buying and selling on wholesale markets. And then last but not least, we analyze the open position and how to make revenues with steering, managing the open position from a prop trader's perspective. This is where we are. We will start the introduction for this chapter with purely analyzing wholesale markets. So we will now explain what a wholesale market for energy does, how it works, what products you can find. That's the framework, wholesale markets and how they work. And then in the next step, we explain how the portfolio management team acts on this market to earn revenues. Let's start with markets and products, day ahead markets for electricity. In many European countries and also in other jurisdictions which have liberalized energy markets, we have day ahead auctions. In case of electricity, these auctions are typically hourly. So electricity for many European countries is traded on power exchanges such as EPEC Spot and Nord Pool, just to give examples. On EPEX, each day at 12 o'clock at noon, prices are determined for the 24 hours of the following day in 24 mostly independent auctions for regions or countries. So Apex Spot has several European markets covered. They all have different auctions and the prices are determined. Well, it's an integrated process by now, but the different markets will end up with different prices. Uh, and the hours are, as we write here, mostly independent. You can submit block bits, which connects the different hours, but just for didactical purposes, assume the 24 hourly prices and auctions are completely independent. So at noon or before noon, actually, both potential buyers and potential sellers submit their bids. How much do they want to buy at which price? How much do they want to sell at which price? The exchange aggregates this to the bid, to the supply and demand curves we have previously discussed, and then intersects the two cur curves with uh, a market pricing algorithm and determines the prices. In essence, however, if you want to keep it simple, the price for each hour equals the intersection of the aggregated supply and demand curve for that hour. And participation in these auctions is voluntary for both sellers and buyers. So that gives us each day at noon 24 different hourly prices for the next day and that's why it's called day ahead. Day ahead electricity trading products. We have a physical day ahead market. So if you buy electricity, you have to specify where it's supposed to be delivered and you get it to that balancing group. We will come back to what a balancing group is later on. You can specify physical delivery for the control areas, for example, Amprion 50 Hertz, INBW Transport and Strom, or also, for example, APG, which is uh, Austrian Power Grid, so it can be Austria. As I said, the exchange has many European countries or markets, regions covered. Four different regions for Germany, one for Austria, for example, but also other regions, North Pole regions, uh, and all other. And in other jurisdictions, for example, in the United States, you have in principle similar system. Smallest delivery volume is 0.1 megawatt for individual hours and blocks. So you can buy down to 0.1 megawatt, 100 kilowatts in 
any given hour if you want. EPEX is the central counterparty for financial and physical settlement. Here is an example of how that works. Here assume we have four different companies or market participants who submit bids to buy or to sell electricity. Let's assume in the table at the top of the slide buying is positive while selling is negative. And let's assume or let's look first at market participant 1 which is horizontally depicted uh, in the first line. Assume this market participant wants to buy 200 megawatts if the price is zero. This market participant also wants to buy 200 megawatts if the price is 6.9, but it wants to buy only 100 megawatts once the price reaches 7 or any value up to 16.9. Of course, um, this could be that the market participant has a generation facility which he decides to turn on if the price reaches 7 or it can be that the consumer decides to shift certain aspects of the business um, to other hours, to later hours for example if the price is above 7 um, and that goes on then at 17 demand is 0 maybe because for this particular market participant maybe because they decide then to produce themselves what they want to consume and then above 17 you see in the first line that the traded volume becomes negative so at any price level above 17 they want to generate and sell electricity first 75 megawatts and then even 275 megawatts for any price above 150. 3000 is the day I had price volume implemented at the exchange so that's the current maximal price in the day ahead auction. Okay something similar for a second market participant, a third market participant, you also see a fourth market participant who wants to buy 200 megawatts no matter what. So regardless of the price this market participant just says well I need the 200 megawatts I'm happy of course if I get them for zero euros the cheaper it is the better but if the price rises to 3000 euros per megawatt hour I still want to buy my 200 megawatts. Okay and then you have an aggregation step which you see uh, at the lower left so the different actors, market participants are aggregated and then you form the lower right an aggregated supply and an aggregated demand curve. And then we intersect this. So this is how the daily day ahead auction for the 24 hours of the following day works. As we said voluntary bid submission you can specify quantities and price levels and you may even shift from being a consumer at low prices to being a seller or producer at high prices depending, totally depending on what your preference is. And then the power exchange determines the price based on aggregated demand and aggregated supply. And then last step is then check at, at that price what the different market actors will do. So assume the price is 150, then we go through the list, the first market actor wants at 150, if that's the intersection of supply and demand, the first actor produces 275 and sells that. The second market actor also sells at this relatively high price 20 megawatts. Third market actor also sells 325 megawatts and only the fourth in this example buys 200 megawatts. However you already see if it would be hypothetically speaking only these four market, market participants but there is obviously more um, then this could not be the equilibrium price because here we would have a total of 620 megawatts which 
uh, would be sold, but only 200 which would be bought. So this price is too high. So this cannot, just based on the four bids and offers submitted, this cannot be the equilibrium. But in reality, in this example, just assume there is other companies who also want to consume at this price and in total, total production exactly equals total consumption because that's how in the last step this equilibrium price was determined. So nearly by definition, if it's the equilibrium price, then we produce or the aggregated production is exactly equal to aggregated consumption. So if we then go into wherever that column, that price brings us um, in this table, going down and taking the column sum is exactly zero. We have exactly as much sold as consumers want to buy. Okay, so this is how this auction works. Here is an example, 24 prices just for an exemplary day. We see during the night prices are relatively low here around 35 euros per megawatt hour. Then during the day starting in the early morning around 6, 7 and 8 prices rise here in this uh, example to levels of around 70 euros per megawatt hour. And then we see the highest price in the early evening like 6, 7, 8 o'clock can be the peak during winter month. Uh, and then it goes down again and shortly before midnight, the last hour of the day already is below the average. It's already back to roughly 45. The average you see in the gray bar is roughly 60 on this day. On this day. But every hour has an individual price. We also see, and I want to like to introduce this at this point already, an orange line, which is the so-called peak electricity price, because as you see here, historically, highest prices because highest demand was observed during the day appeared roughly between 8 and 8 in the evening so 8 a.m. and 8 p.m. that was when demand was highest and that was defined as peak so if you want to buy a peak product that's always the hours from 8 a.m. to 8 p.m. during working days while the base is always covering by definition the whole period so this is an exemplary day, how 24 prices can look like. Here is a second exemplary date, day. And here the price structure looks in some respects similar, but in others strikingly different. So again, we start with relatively low prices during the night. Then we see a strong increase during the day in the early morning. And so the hours seven and eight or eight and nine are relatively high. But then what we observe is a steep drop in prices again, down to between 25 and 29 euros until 16, 1700, so 4 p.m., 5 p.m., when they rise again, and again reach the peak in the evening, roughly eight or nine p.m., with more than 40 euros. And then it goes down again. So maybe we should be crystal clear on this. This is also something I find very interesting. How much variation these hourly prices have. That's why I said electricity today is a different product from electricity tomorrow. You can even be more specific here. Electricity at 3 a.m. in the night is a completely different product from electricity at 8 p.m. in the evening. And here the factor is nearly two between the lowest price hour and the highest price hour. Not quite, but close to. So that's one important lesson to learn. A lot of price variation during the hours. Again, it matters. You have to specify when you want the electricity to be delivered. And the second element is, of course, what's driving the decline during the day. What happens that despite the fact that I said highest demand, highest consumption typically is during the day, we have very low prices during the day. I leave that for you to work out. Think about it. I'm sure you will figure it out. 
We, of course, in the course, will also discuss this in the next session. Okay, here are other examples for day ahead electricity trading price developments. Here you see how high certain hours can be. So here is a very, very long period. We have exemplary prices for 20 years. It's not important whether it's recent or not. It's just important um, how much fluctuation you see. And you see that you have price spikes, which are tremendously high. I said the exchange has an upper limit of 3000 euros per megawatt hour in place. So the price cannot rise above that level. But you see here that this actually has been observed. For example, in the year 2000, 2006, prices were very high. But you also see that there is most variation or the majority of the prices is in an area of say between 10 and 50 or 60 euros per megawatt hour. That's a typical price. But also here, interesting fact three, you see negative prices. One of the elements, stylized facts of energy and in particular electricity markets that prices can within hours turn from positive to negative. Also not the subject of this energy trading, portfolio management and risk management, energy management class. Here we focus on the market and don't, don't go into the fundamentals or the economics behind this. But of course for market participants this is very important. The price for certain hours can turn negative. And if you then do some calculations or some trading activities, you have to be aware of this. Many models do not take this into account. Many models, of course, just assume positive prices. So this is an interesting stylized element of electricity markets. Okay, then if we move into the graph a little bit here, you see the annual averages for the different years, for the 20 years covered in this time period. And you see that the annual averages are typically between 20 and 50. Sometimes, I think 2008 it was, they were above 50, but that's more, at least in the past, the exception than the rule. These averages are driven by fundamentals such as investment costs, for example. If the price persistently would be above total costs for new installations, people, investors would build new generation assets. That's why there is some sort of mean reversion process taking place here. So it's unlikely that the price for several years in a row is extremely low or extremely high because the market, the system will adapt. And that's what you see here when they're often in a range. And yeah, we also again see that they are typically in a range, most of the volumes are in a range of 20 to 50, but you see a significant amount of outliers, price spikes significantly higher than that. Okay, moving from electricity to natural gas. So far we have discussed electricity, but I said all we do in this course is also valid for natural gas. Let's just briefly show how it looks for natural gas. I don't have to rediscuss most of this, but there is also a range. Natural gas is a little bit easier to store than electricity. It's not quite that expensive, so there is a little bit less volatility for natural gas. Typically, most of the volumes for natural gas trading is not on the hourly products, but on daily products. So typically, you buy a base delivery profile for a whole day, and then you get the, the natural gas delivered for the 24 hours of a day. But even in gas, that can be seen on this slide here, there is within day pricing for balancing. So even there, um, there is more volatility during the day. And essentially, all we said so far, supply and demand drive the price. It's influenced by seasonality. It's influenced uh, by uncertainty and so on is still valid. And there is markets. You can buy natural gas 
for example, also on the European Power Exchange, on the Nord Pool Exchange, um, on other exchanges in the UK, in the United States, and wherever you have liberalized markets, Australia, New Zealand, you name it. So the fundamental concept remains valid for natural gas. Okay, so this was the day ahead market. Let's move on to forwards and futures. For that, we again have to remember the two time dimensions. Electricity today is a different product from electricity tomorrow. Two time dimensions need to be distinguished for trading on energy markets. The first, the delivery period. Energy today is a different product from energy tomorrow. So here we have the question, when will the energy be delivered and thus also be consumed? Because it is consumed typically in real time. This information, delivery period, classifies the product. For example, the front year contract specifies energy delivered next year starting on the 1st of January and ending on the 31st of December. That's the front year next year, and that's a product you can buy on the market. I want to buy electricity, which is delivered as a base next year. Okay, so this is the first time period, the delivery period. And then we have a second, at least, of the same importance time period, which is the trading period. This specifies when the contract is concluded. For example, I can buy this front year contract today, right now, in real time. I can buy a forward or a future. I can also do this tomorrow or next month. But of of course, the same product, we are still talking the front year base delivery in this example, has a different price yet again. So if I buy it today, we have a certain expectation how next year is going to be, economic growth and so on, which sets demand, which also sets prices fundamentals such as power plant developments. We have an expectation on this today, but maybe we have a different expectation on how these fundamentals develop next year. A month from now, the year still hasn't started, but we have a different expectation. And thus, the forward or future contract, the same product will trade at a different price. This trading period is pretty similar to what you are aware of already from regular share markets, like company shares, such as Siemens or Google Alphabet or whatever. So you are totally used to that the same product, Siemens share, has different prices depending on when you buy it. If you buy today, complete different price from if you buy next month. May by accident or chance be similar, but typically you have a lot of volatility in these share prices, even though it's the same product you always buy at the Siemens company. It's just that the market assessment, the market expectation of the net present value of Siemens shares has changed. So that's the second time period, the trading period. And you truly must differentiate these two. They both lead to differentiations in prices, differences in prices, but for different reasons. Okay, to go a little bit more in detail on this, the delivery period or fulfillment period of a future product defines the product. Example, the delivery of electricity on February 24th from 0 to 24 is different product is a different product than a base load contract for 2017 for example energy which was delivered in all 8760 hours of the year 2017 so from the 1st of January 2017 uh, midnight until the end of that year on the 21st 
of December 2017 also at midnight. So this year is obviously already in the past, but you can also uh, specify yet a different uh, year in the future. And again, these products have different prices, especially since electricity can only be stored to a limited extent, and thus the prices in periods of high demand are citrus paribus higher than in times of low demand. If you re remember the question I raised a few minutes ago, here we explicitly write, read that sentence carefully, the prices in period of high demand are Ceteris paribus higher than in times of low demand. So if everything else remains equal, then higher demand directly translates into higher prices, but that's not necessarily the case. The missing piece before on the slide was, of course, solar power. During the day, demand increases, yes, but the sun also goes up and the photovoltaic modules start producing electricity. It may well be that the increased generation, which is cost-free from the, on the variable costs, um, so once the module is installed, any additional megawatt, um, the derivative of the production cost function uh, with regard to that specific megawatt is zero, so the variable costs of solar power are zero, and in short term, that's why I'm referring to it as being cost-free. In the long term, of course, you have to buy the module. But in the short term, we have a lot of electricity entering the system at very low variable costs, virtually zero. And if we have more PV feed in, then the load increase, then that offsets the effect, and instead of rising, prices decline. So that's what happened on the price slide which had significantly lower prices during the day than it had in the morning and in the evening. Okay, so that's again what makes these different products, delivery periods defining the product so important. Again, some more examples, electricity with delivery on weekends is cheaper than on working days. Due to holidays, delivery prices for December contracts in Germany with a Christmas break are usually lower than delivery prices in January. And I'm sure other countries, even without having holidays on Christmas, have holidays during other times and their economic activity drops and then this relatively low demand will translate systematically into lower prices. We said night hours are cheaper than day hours and hours with a lot of renewable energy generation are, again, citrus paribus, cheaper than hours during the day. Uh, sorry, than uh, hours with less renewable generation, of course. Okay, so again, that was the first time dimension when is the energy delivered and consumed. Here, we move on to the second the trading period of a futures contract. The products, for example, a base year contract in the future, are traded over a longer period of time. Just to give an example, the front year contract on the European Energy Exchange is quoted for five, seven, eight years in the past. So before, if you look in the future, the year let's say 2040, will start being traded around the year, or at least start to be quoted around the year 2032. But in the beginning, it's not going to be very liquid, but a few years before delivery, in particular two years before delivery, that year will pick up speed and volumes and will be traded liquidly with more liquidity, roughly two years before delivery, three years before delivery, and then it will be traded a lot as soon as it becomes the front year, which for the 2040 contract will happen in 2039. Okay, so we have a lot, a long, relatively long trading period, which typically is longer than the delivery period. And although it is the same product, we are all, always talking like the front year contract or even 2040 if we want so. Um, a different price is set every day based on expectations. 
even for yearly forwards, the price can fluctuate by more than 100% over the trading period. For example, if an unforeseen economic crisis hits, uh, and we were assuming that the frontier would have solid economic activity, but then crisis hit, pandemic, whatever, then the price can go down if we assume that demand will be low. And sometimes this fluctuation over the trading period of the contract can be more than 100%. So the same year can be traded, for example, at 30 euros, and a few months later it can be traded at 60 euros. It always depends on how expectations for the delivery period change. Same year price varies by 100%, but again, you are used to significant fluctuations, for example, for the Siemens share as well, just depending on the forecasts for, as we said, economic value of Siemens. Here, the expectations of suppliers and buyers, in particular with regard to the future spot price of the delivery period, determine the price. This is a very important thing to remember. In the end, it's the spot price. So all the futures and forwards for future periods are a bet on the expected future spot price because you can always wait and sell the electricity there so if you buy say a frontier contract now you always have the possibility to sell the electricity in the spot market that is your alternative And thus, the price you are willing to pay today to buy this forward contract is strongly driven, strongly depends on your expectation on what the spot price will be. Same thing if you just want to consume the electricity yourself. You are a large chemical uh, facility and you have your own portfolio management. You, need, you know I will need electricity next year and you consider buying a forward. Again, you ask yourself, if I buy it on the forward, what am I willing, forward market, what am I willing to pay for the frontier contract? Well, my alternative would be to buy the electricity next year on the spot market. So what I'm willing to pay for the forward today depends and correlates strongly with what I expect the spot market to be. There is also a risk premium, very importantly, so it's not exactly equal. I don't want to go at this point too much into that, uh, how they truly correlate. Uh, it's a very controversial subject how large a risk premium is, it's hard to quantify. Um, there is even different uh, methodological approaches for that. Um, but in the end, they are strictly, strongly connected. Forward and the spot expected for delivery period. What is, of course, hardly related is today's spot with the price for the frontier. That's different products. That's how the Siemens share is related to SAP. Different companies. Of course, there is some general correlation from the, let's say, meta market perspective. So we could say, of course, if we have a very scarce electricity system tomorrow at the moment, then maybe it tends to be scarce next year as well. Depends on what's crucially driving tomorrow's price. If it's just that we expect specifically an abundance of renewable energy, then that's essentially meaningless for next year, because for next year we expect an average. We don't know how much renewable infeed we will have, so we will work with the expectation. And if tomorrow we know all the windmills are producing, all the solar power plants are producing, price will be low or even negative, but that has hardly any or no meaning whatsoever for the price next year. So that's again the point. Of course, the different projects, products, sorry, are much less related spot and future. 
what is related is future and corresponding spot during the time of delivery. These two are related, but not so much today's spot versus next year future. Okay, I hope I made that clear. It's very important to explain. Here you see some exemplary variation in the forward contract for a year Y. So here is just an example of how the forward for a year trades on the year before delivery. So this is a typical front year contract price development. You see beginning of January on the year before delivery, the contract opened roughly at 32 euros and 50 cents in the red line. That's the settlement price for the contract. And then it decreased and then it increased to roughly 34 sometime in February. And then the closer we got to the year end, um, the prices got lower and lower and this contract finished at 28. So in that year, the total variance, the difference was just roughly five euros. But as I said, it can be up to 100%. So the same contract front year can be traded at 60 and at 30 over the course of the trading period uh, of that contract. So this is just to show again this second time element how the price for the same product varies over time. We also have some more information here. You see that during the day there is also some variation. We see uh, the low price in the light gray and the high price in the darker gray. And then we have some uh, averages, some so-called moving averages, 38 in the blue, uh, in the yeah, somewhat blue, uh, 100 days in the yellow, and 200 days moving average in the green. Right, okay, so that's how trading forwards in general works, uh, if we differentiate necessarily these two time periods. Then let's move on to which products are available. And for that, we have to introduce the concept of liquidity. Liquidity answers the question, how quickly and at what cost can I open and close positions in a market or product? At what costs and how quickly can I essentially buy and sell, for example, base load contracts? And here the issue is 2040 is very illiquid because it's still significantly in the future. And essentially, who is thinking about buying or selling the contract year 2040 at the moment? Very few people. So liquidity is low because how quickly and at what cost can I open and close positions if I want to buy calendar year 2040 today, it's possible. There is no law against it. I can do it, but I would have to call traders. I would, for example, have to call RWE, EDF, large generators. Hi, I'm interested in buying electricity base load 2040. At what price would you deliver? And then you get a quote and you could do it. But then once you've bought it, if you hear in terms of liquidity assessment, want to resell it hypothetically, you realize, oh my gosh, I don't need it that much anymore. So I want to sell it again. Well, then again, you have to call and probably you will get a discount only. So you will not get as much as you bought it for. Like there is the bid ask spread to go through. And the wider the bid ask spread is, uh, the more expensive and the less liquid the product is by definition. So, and of course, the assumption here is more liquidity is better than less. Obviously, if you can easily go in and out of positions quickly and without losing much money, then trading is more mature and more beneficial. And it's easier, for example, if, if you want to already deal with the risk 2040, because that's not completely absurd. Assume, for example, you want to invest in a wind farm. And you build the asset and you know it's there for 25, 30 years whatsoever. You already know you have an inherent long position in 2040 if you build it today. And it would actually be nice if you could already sell it. 
and there is product for that as a set, but it's not very liquid because there's not that many wind farms built on a daily or hourly basis, they would be quoted. But still, you can buy and sell this. Okay, so more liquidity is better than less. Participation on the various trading platforms and then the various products is voluntary. The more suppliers and buyers are interested in the respective product, the more liquid the market is. So we want to have buyers and sellers who on their own foundation are interested or from their own interest would like to trade these products. And then what we have is a trade-off between a product fit, for example, a municipality wants to buy the load structure of an industrial customer, let's say in hourly resolutions for the front year. That is what the municipality needs right now. Assume they sold electricity to a customer to an industrial client and they know what they sold and now they want to close the position they want to buy it on the wholesale market that's exactly what they need but the problem is nobody else is interested in that particularly interested in that because this single profile is probably unique to that specific client so the municipality wants to trade it now but essentially nobody else has a true interest in that specific profile at the moment so it's going to be illiquid. But it would fit very nice, that's product fit. But the, on the other end of this trade-off is liquidity. And liquidity is, for example, much higher in the baseload market, annual baseload contract, because that's a standard. Like, if you want to deliver electricity to client, you always have a certain share which pretty much is going to be consumed throughout the year from the 1st of January until the 31st uh, of December. And that's the so-called base load product as a set. And then in addition, you have the so-called peak load product we already introduced, delivery from 8 in the morning till 8 in the evening during working days. And with these two, you can already approximate a load profile for a customer. So there was an agreement, the market agreed on these two standardized products and they are relatively liquidly traded. That is what the market agreed upon as the trade-off between product fit on the one hand and liquidity, meaning everybody wants to trade it on the other hand. And the establishment of such standard products on the one hand approximates the structure and on the other hand guarantees liquidity. And the power exchanges and uh, non-power exchanges, also trading energy, did a very nice job developing these contracts, these standard products over time. Whenever an exchange wants to enter an energy trading or an energy commodity market, they try to offer, of course, products of high interest to the participants, to the market participants in that market, because um, the exchange wants to offer a service which is buying and selling or making, enabling the clients to buy and sell. And the more liquid and the better the fit of the product is, and the more activity they see on their platform, and that's where they earn their revenues from. So what products and prices have developed? We have short-term products, day ahead, other day products, Tuesday, Wednesday, Thursday. We have weekend products and then we have whole weeks. You can buy again the front week, which is energy delivered next week. Then we have medium-term products, the front month, which always is next month. Then other month, quarters, you can trade up to eight quarters in the future. And then the long end, long term products, summer, winter, and in particular the front year and other annual products. So that's products and prices. And regarding liquidity, you see here that typically 
the closer it gets to delivery, so the, f the f day ahead, the front day in a way, the front month, the front year always have the highest liquidity, while other products, the more in the future it gets, the less liquidity there typically is. So the next question then is, what do we do if we want to approximate with these standard products, which are always a trade-off between product fit and liquidity? What do we do to use these products to replicate a certain demand profile, for example, coming back to this industrial consumer we as a municipality sold electricity to? We know we need an hourly profile. Question is, what do we do? And here on this slide, you see how it's organized that we get the best possible fit. Here you can see in the orange, the base part, certain base part can be fit in. It may even be a little bit more than the minimum load of the client. Nobody forces us to set the base part equal to the minimum load of the client. So quite often, and in reality, most of the time, it's better to buy more base and during certain very low demand hours, resell a little bit leftover energy back to the market. So we can put an orange base product and use that to approximate our client's profile. And then we can put peak contracts from 8 a.m. to 8 p.m. here in yellow to approximate the black line, which is the hourly client specific profile. And then what remains to be traded is the red part. And you see here that the red part is already significantly smaller. So not only do we have to buy significantly less remaining electricity to in the end serve this client, the other significant advantage is we can manage the risk. So for example, if you sold the electricity to the industrial consumer today, if you don't buy it, you have a risk. Price on the wholesale market may increase, price on the wholesale market may decrease. If the price decreases, then that risk essentially is a chance. It's always two sides of the same coin, we're coming back to that. So if the price decreases on the wholesale market, you have the chance to buy the electricity to sold, you sold to that industrial consumer later at a lower price. But you also have the risk that the price rises and you pay more. And if you feel, well, today is a pretty good price, actually, I should also buy on the wholesale market to get rid of this price risk. Well, then you can buy the orange part and the yellow part, and you have a very, very significantly reduced price risk only for the red part. And if you do a little bit more, there is a so-called base peak equivalent uh, to any given load profile, then you have hardly any remaining base and peak price risk, but you still have an hourly price risk. We are also coming back to that. So with these two products, the goals of good liquidity on the one hand by concentrating on a few standard products and good mapping of customer load profiles are combined in a compromise. And that's how it works. For gas again, the characteristics differ slightly while it's mostly identical. Natural gas is economically and technically storable even in larger dimensions. As I said, it's not as costly. And it's also compressible. For example, um, injection and withdrawal do not need to match every second. So I already said the fundamental principle storage is costly remains valid, but in the very short time, it's a little bit easier to balance. Uh, and for that reason, the future market for gas has slightly different standard products. They only have the base product. They don't have the from eight in the morning till eight in the evening peak product. But that's the only major difference here. The most things remain 
valid. So still you approximate your client profile um, with the available products. Okay, and for this, for forward and futures trading, there is a lot of market places in Europe. We have already mentioned the EPEC spots for day ahead trades in several European regions. We have mentioned the European Energy Exchange for, for, for futures trading. Uh, and we have also briefly mentioned Nordpool as a competitor to the European Energy Exchange and the EPEX actually. But here on this slide you see the abundance of marketplaces. The introduction of energy markets was driven forward on the initiative of the European Union. Marketplaces for electricity uh, and natural gas and European emission allowances for CO2 and several other products uh, and electricity exchanges have now formed in almost all countries. So this is just to show how relevant our topic is and if you're from any other liberalized country, you will have some other marketplaces, but essentially a similar setup as long as it's liberalized. Okay, let's move on to alternative forms of trading. Where and how can you trade? You can trade on exchanges. You can trade on OTC broker platforms and you can trade OTC bilateral. On the left, we have the exchanges. That is the standardized state supervised exchanges. For example, the European Energy Exchange, where, as I said, I'm the, in the current exchange council. Uh, we always have the uh, supervising authority, which is an, a ministry in Saxony. They are always present in the Exchange Council meetings. They are supervising the whole process. So exchanges are regulated and they also provide a central counterparty. They have standardized products. They provide clearing services such as data transfers, confirmation uh, and other services. They are mostly electronic trading. The access is via exchange members. So in order to be allowed to trade on the exchange, you have to be a member. If you are not a member, you can pay a commission to a member to do it for you. There is fixed transaction costs. Buying and selling megawatt hours on these exchanges costs a certain fee, of course, because the exchange uh, has costs which need to be covered. It's anonymous because the exchange is always the central counterparty and it's transparent due to requirements and legislation. Exchanges have to provide all sorts of information. So that is one way to buy forward, for example, the front year base electricity forward. Or actually it's a future for, for an exchange. We come back to that differentiation later. I could buy essentially the same products with differences which we are covering here on this slide, but the same electricity which gets delivered from January 1st until December 31st from an OTC broker platform. OTC stands for over the counter, which historically meant that two people meet and agree on terms of a business deal over a counter, for example, in the bank. This is over the counter trading. Nowadays, brokers have professionalized this and they provide broker platforms, which can be like a web application or you can even talk on the phone. So if you uh, have the chance to visit at some point trading floor, you will have a lot of verbal noise in the background that still is voice broking. So you can talk to a broker if you want, for example, somewhat less liquidly traded product and tell your broker, can you ask around, please? Uh, how do I get peak product delivered three years from now? So that's the middle column here, OTC broker deals. The credit risk here is with the counterparty. So 
what happens once you do a deal, the counterparty is revealed. And then you know I, for example, buy electricity from, say, EDF. And the broker just brings us together. He's acting, providing the market and making the deal feasible, but the broker is not truly involved in the deal itself, just by matching the interest. The deal itself is then purely between you and EDF. EDF and you sign a contract. And then, of course, if your counterparty runs into problems, or if you run into problems, your counterparty has a risk. That's the credit risk. For the exchange, it was different in the left column. The exchange acted as central counterparty. And the exchange thus bought and sold and acted in a way as a middleman. And as long as the exchange remains solvent, you will always get the deal executed. And as exchanges are state supervised, it's really rare that they default on a deal. And the credit risk typically for an exchange is significantly lower than the credit risk you have with any counterparty, even a counterparty as established and solvent and state-owned as, for example, EDF. And then if you go down to some dubious energy trading company, for example, if I figure out well, what I'm so good in theory, let's put it to practice, uh, and I start um, an electricity trading company, then, of course, there is a significant chance that it may or may not work. Uh, and then there is significant counterparty risk for everybody who trades with such individuals. As I said, has happened in the past. Okay, so the credit risk of the counterparty is an element when the OTC broker just provides or manages, establishes the deal. We can have telephone or electronic trading. Transaction costs are according to general agreements. They are negotiable. Removal of anonymity when concluding a contract. So with the exchange on the left, you never know where the electricity was actually coming from you bought because you always make the contract with the exchange. And whether EDF sold to the exchange or RWE or anybody else, you will never know because you only see I buy from, from the exchange. And the exchange, of course, sees, well, and I'm buying it from RWE or EDF or whomever, but the exchange deals with RWE. So you, being the buyer in this example, do not see this. With the OTC broker, as I said, it's different. Firstly, you do not know where the bid or the quote, the ask was coming from. But once you click it and you agree to do the deal, then you hear and see, well, I do it with RWE or EDF or whomever. So the removal of anonymity when concluding a contract. And in general, this it's the last point here, it's semi-transparent. There is a voluntary publication, but not more. So it's less regulated for, for good and for bad, if you want. Less bureaucracy, but also less transparency. Last but not least, you have over-the-counter deals, which are negotiated bilaterally. That's the example I mentioned, if you want to buy electricity delivered 2040. You don't see that liquidly traded on the exchange today. Probably typical broker platforms also won't be able to come up with a quote, even if you ask your broker, can you please ask around, is anybody willing to sell electricity delivery 2040 base? Unlikely that that works. However, what you can do is over-the-counter deals bilaterally. So you can talk to, but it's not the trading department. It's typically an origination department or some, some other specialized department, which then uh, evaluates the risks and the chances associated with trading electricity for 2040. And then you bilaterally negotiate this individual product in terms of how it is specified, how the contract is, is looking, and also how and when it's delivered and what the price is. Of course, here, if you 
negotiate from the beginning bilaterally with EDF or RWE, you have, of course, always the credit risk of the counterparty. Transaction costs, in my view, are implicit and variable because typically the contract you finally sign does not have a transaction cost component, but you agree on terms which both sides find favorable. And of course, if it takes a week to set up the contract because negotiations are so complex and you need your mid office to evaluate the proper price, then that is implicitly included in the contract. And this is, of course, non-transparent because you would never hear about it. If company X signs a bilateral contract with company Y, you don't hear about it, but that is not for the general public to hear about. It's probably correct that they don't have to report this. This slide shows a typical broker platform. Here you see how market participants buy and sell energy commodities on broker platforms. This is a pretty advanced screen, which could in this or a similar form also be observed at a power exchange, at an organized exchange. But here what the broker provides is essentially in the nature just the cells in this screen and some other things we discuss in a minute. But in these cells, market participants who want to trade can submit bids and offers for a variety of products. For example, in the left main column, you see Germany base load. Then you see Germany peak load, then Germany off peak, Netherlands base load, Germany 0 to 6 a.m., Germany 20 to 24 a.m. And then just again to highlight that it's not all about electricity, you have API 2, which is a hard coal quotation at Amsterdam, Rotterdam, Antwerpen harbors. And you also have natural gas, TTF, title transfer facility, high calorific gas. And on the bottom right, you even have emission allowances. And then, then on the bottom left, you see recent trades. This screen here will be in place in a similar form anywhere where energy as a commodity is traded. In the end, the screen visualizes the different bids and offers entered by the market participants who want to trade, who want to either buy or sell. This screen here is one of the last screenshots I took when I left the company, or actually I think it's even later. A friend of mine uh, tended to send me more recent updates on this screen. So this is not something which is uh, which has happened right now, but I still keep it to show the idea and I still want to use this in this video. Advantage, of course, having uh, somewhat older material on this is that it's free to use. Okay, so what do we see? As we said, we see the different products and then we see bids, asks and quantities. And I would like to dive into this and look at it deeper. And that is bids, asks, and the bid ask spread. So what market participants submit is bids, asks, or if they don't want to, nothing. So once again, everything entered in this screen is voluntarily done by market participants who would like to buy or who would like to sell. And the numbers on the screens are an offer to trade. If we look at the bid first and you see in the lower right a magnified part of the screen we had on the slide before, if we focus on the bids first, then a bid 
is entered by a potential buyer of a commodity. The bid consists of the bid price and the bid quantity. That's the two things you see here. Quantity 5 means 5 megawatt for the product Germany baseload. So this means the bid by the potential buyer specifies this potential buyer would be willing to buy Germany baseload for the whole year specified on the left for the 8,000 for baseload, so for 8,760 hours at a price of 8405 euros per megawatt hour. So the bid, again, to repeat, consists of the bid price here in the very first line, 4805, and the quantity, 5 megawatts for the period of 8760 hours of the year. The bid price represents the maximum price that the buyer is willing to pay for the commodity. So here in this example, in the first line, we have one potential buyer who is willing to pay 4805. And then we have two more buyers who are both willing to pay 48 euros. So not quite that much. So if you want to sell, for example, 10 megawatts uh, of base load for that year, you can do that by first clicking on the bid of 4805. And then a window opens, do you really want to make the trade? And then you confirm. Or you can even turn that feature off. So if you click immediately, you sold 48.05, uh, sorry, 5 megawatts at 48.05 euros per megawatt hour. And then if you want to sell the next five, we said you're supposed to sell 10 in this example. Well, that can only be sold at 48, so you get less. Because this shows the open interest in the market. And on a voluntary basis, one bidder bids 48.05. The next is willing to pay 48 flat only. Okay, and the bid quantity, of course, represents the quantity that the buyer is willing to buy for that price. Note that the quantity is fixed. If you want to sell less or buy less than what's specified here, you can't do that by clicking on there. You have to ask the broker over the phone, that person, you don't know it because it's anonymous at this point, who has the bid at 48.05, would that person be willing to buy four megawatts instead of five? Because five is a standardized order. Uh, from my experience, when I was doing this, quite often, yes, it worked. Sometimes they said, no, we want the standard size because it's easier to later uh, get rid of or whatever. Okay, so that's the bid side. So if you, watching the screen, want to sell, then you are looking for a potential buyer and that buyer has given, has shown his or her interest in the bid. So if you want to sell, you click on the bid and you immediately sold at the value specified in the bid. Or if you want to sell, you have an alternative. You could submit an ask on the slightly further right column. The asks are offers from potential sellers and there by clicking you buy. You initially initiate buying if you click on an ask. So if you click on a bid, you sell. If you click on an ask, you buy. And retrospectively, of course, reversely, the bidder wants to sell. Uh, sorry, the bidder wants to buy while the person submitting the ask wants to sell. Okay, so let's look at the ask here. The potential seller of a commodity places an ask or same uh, thing, an offer. So it's sometimes called bid ask spread, for example, sometimes bid offer spread. So ask and offer are synonymous in this regard. The ask consists of the ask price and the ask 
quantity. The ask price represents the minimum price that a seller is willing to take for the commodity. The ask quantity again represents the specified exact quantity the seller is willing to sell at that price. And here we have one person who is willing to sell at 48.10. So if you want to buy, you click on 48.10 and you buy at 48.10. If you want more at that specific moment, you would have to go to the next um, available ask and that's at 48.15. So you already have to pay slightly more. And that, that actually is another measure for market liquidity. How, can you, how much can you buy at moderate or low price changes. And if you just have one potential ask, and if you buy that, the market is already empty and nobody else wants to sell, then that's pretty illiquid. While here, this I would say is a relatively liquid market, just five cents between the best bid, so the highest bid and the lowest ask, means if you would have to buy and immediately sell again, you would only lose these five cents. First, you click for buying on the ask on the right, you buy for 48.10, and then for whatever reason you have to sell, you sell at 48.05 immediately, you just lose the bid ask spread, the difference between the two, and here in this example, that's just five cents. Of course, you usually wouldn't want to do that. It's just, as I explained, a few minutes ago. Uh, it is about measuring liquidity and the more liquid the trading is, uh, the less transaction costs you face in general and that is considered better. So that's bid and ask explained using the example of a broker screen. Really hands-on. Then we have the bid ask spread was already mentioned a few times but here it's defined. A bid ask spread is the amount by which the ask price exceeds the bid price for a commodity. The difference between bid and ask prices or this spread is one central indicator for the liquidity of an asset. In general, the smaller the spread, the better the liquidity. A trade or transaction occurs when a buyer in the market is willing to pay the best offer available, or if the seller is willing to sell at the highest bid. So all these hundreds or even thousands of traders sitting in front of the screen watching the market, they can again either submit and enter their own bids and asks here. And then of course, if you have registered for the platform, it immediately appears on the platform. Uh, or you can initiate a deal by simply clicking on what somebody else provided. So again, if you want to buy, you either click on an ask, or if you want a better price, you submit a bid and hope that somebody else clicks your bid. Okay, let's move on from the broker screen, which we now used to explain bid offer spreads, bids and offers as well. Move on to exchanges. In principle, an exchange, like from the pure trading perspective, has a lot of similarities compared to that screen. An exchange, also an energy exchange, I must say at this point, also has a lot of similarities to stock exchanges as you know, like the NYMEX or the Börse in Frankfurt. All these exchanges trade products. Here, of course, it's energy commodities for the energy exchanges. A lot of information can be found on the websites of these exchanges. Some information is free. For example, most, most often you see recent information. Some information, for example, historical time series, are behind paywalls. We are currently buying a lot of information from the exchanges uh, and they found that this information is valuable, so they, you have to pay in order to use it. An example for such an energy exchange is the European Energy Exchange, the EEX. And on their webpage, market data for several products 
can be found. And I would like you to look on the webpage of the European Energy Exchange and check the market data section for most recent quotes on the front here for baseload electricity contract. If you want to go for Germany, if you're watching from France, go for France or whatever you're most interested in, Austria, Austria. Uh, so please look up the baseload electricity contract for the frontier, the natural gas contract for the frontier, and if you're in Europe, the CO2 emission allowance price for the frontier. And then if you want to get virtual bonus points, check what a power plant would earn if it would operate 8,760 hours and convert natural gas at an efficiency of say 60% into electricity and also has to pay for CO2 emission allowances. Luckily, gas-fired power stations do not produce 8,760 hours, but they select the most profitable hours, which means of course prices above the base load price. So if a power plant is not earning any revenues in the base, that's saying it's certainly not operated 8,760 hours a year, but that does not imply that it does not earn any revenue. Okay, so please look this up and report back in the next inverted classroom or via email if you want. Let's move on to long-term forward and futures markets. Why are they used? Well, we have already said electricity prices are volatile and generators and utilities therefore want to hedge risks. That means they want to protect themselves against fluctuations and uncertainty. They may also pursue revenues from trading activities. So either they just want to mitigate and manage risk. For example, we have already discussed um, this municipality which has sold electricity to an industrial customer and now considers whether to buy this on the wholesale market or not. That would be one application. If they want to reduce the risk, they immediately buy what they sold. And then they are flat, no open position. We will go into the details on that. But here we are in the broader section of prop trading, and that would imply seeking revenues from trading activities. We are coming back to that as well, but essentially buying low and selling high. Forward contracts are usually settled physically, while futures are settled financially. That's one of the crucial differences between forwards and futures. However, to start maybe with the common element, they have near identical payoff profiles. So at least nine out of 10 times buying a forward is pretty equivalent to buying a future. They have certain differences, but like purely looking at the prices and starting here, giving in a way an introduction on the topic, it's usually identical payoff profiles. Okay, for forwards, however, payments are usually restricted to the delivery period. The EFAP framework agreement specifies the 20th of a month settles payments for the previous month. In case of futures, the power exchange requires a prompt, usually at least daily, compensation between the contract price and the current market price on the margin account. So for the power exchange, if you buy something for 50 and the price changes, you have to provide the difference so that even if you go bankrupt, the uh, the exchange is still fine. So if you buy for 50 and the price drops, say, to 30, the exchange without margin calls would face a risk because if you bail out, can't pay due to bankruptcy, you have promised to pay 50 for the good, but you can't. 
The exchange now has the commodity which it thought was sold to you for 50, but the market price is 30. So yes, it can sell it alternatively, but not for 50, but instead for 30. And this difference is the margin call the exchange on at least a daily basis um, withdraws from your account to keep this risk at bay. On the plus side, this is why we already said exchanges tend to not go bankrupt because they have very, very limited financial risks. So that's how it works on the futures market for traded on a trading exchange. For the forwards, just to repeat, for example, the European Federation of Energy Traders, EFET, has a framework agreement which specified on the 20th of a month settlements payments for the previous month are made. Meaning, if we now buy a frontier contract, we just sign the contract, but no money flows. No money changes hands just yet. Because we bought for the frontier uh, and we will the first time exchange money on the 20th of the month of first delivery for the frontier that's going to be the 1st of January. So on the 20th of February, this forward contract, if EFED rules are specified, will see the first payment. For that reason, actually, there is a smaller price difference between forwards and futures um, because the payment profiles, like uh, the interest rate developments, have to be taken into account. If you buy a forward, you can keep the money longer. Um, okay, and last but not least, futures are, as we said, standardized exchange traded products. But the settlement, well, is similar in financial terms. So if you bought for 50 and the spot turns out to be 70, regardless of whether you bought a forward or a future, your payoff is 20 euros. Uh, but there's also some differences we will also cover. So let's start with the profit and loss of the contract, which result from the difference between the forward price and the spot price of the delivery period. So for the forward, this is as T minus F. So the price on the spot market minus the forward price. And this is very similar for the future. It's also ST minus F for the future in this case. Hence, I say in the second bullet, electricity futures and forwards have near identical payment structures. It's always depending on the spot price, whether it was worthwhile in the end or not buying or selling the forward. However, futures are usually settled financially. So in the power exchanges do usually not coordinate physical delivery, but they're more meant as financial hedging or trading instruments. So the future is just benchmarked against the spot price and only euros change hands. While the forwards include typically physical delivery of the commodity to a specified venue. So if you buy a forward and you hold it when it becomes due, you get delivered physically the energy commodity. That's actually one of the, the issues that happened in Texas when oil prices became negative. People were sitting, financial traders were sitting on forward contracts and they couldn't get rid of them, but they had no way to store the oil. I mean, it doesn't look very good if in front of your investment banking skyscraper in the middle of Manhattan, uh, lorry after lorry, truck after truck of heating oil is trying to deliver, or even crude oil. So, well, but on the other hand, like typically 
All these actors we are describing here, or many of them, are interested in the physical world as well. The exception is the trading houses, the investment banks, the hedge funds. Usually the municipality, for example, has a final, has a final obligation to deliver energy, electricity, natural gas to its clients. So the municipality needs physical delivery. Otherwise, the clients are sitting in the dark and in the cold. At the same time, if you have these generation assets, of course, they produce physical natural gas or physical electricity. So for that, we also need a physical instrument. We produce electricity and we need a buyer who in the end takes the physical delivery. So both forwards and futures have advantages. One, the future is more financial. The other, the forward is more physical. One, the future is exchange traded. The other, the forward, typically organized by brokers. But the general payoff profile, like the value of buying today, either forward or future for say 50, depends both times on the spot price, because that's always the alternative. If you have financial settlement, then it's immediately and directly settled against the spot price financially. But if you have a forward with physical delivery, then well, what would be your alternative? Your alternative would be if you buy the forward physical delivery, you could also buy on the spot with physical delivery. So in the end, again, if you paid more on your forward than the spot price quotes, you paid in a way ex post too much. It would have been better in retrospect to go for the, for the uh, day ahead for the spot and buy on the spot. Okay, that's the last point here. Just to repeat, futures are usually traded on exchanges, while forwards are mostly traded over the counter OTC. OTC markets can include purely bilateral, highly specialized agreements, but they are also very liquid and highly standardized OTC broker platforms, as the one we looked at two slides ago. Okay, here the payment profile, just to make that crystal clear, the example a forward future with delivery price of 25 euros per megawatt hour. And let's assume we are long, so we bought this forward or future. Doesn't really matter in this regard. So we paid 25 euros per megawatt hour for a product which now trades on the spot market. And you see on the horizontal axis here, the spot market. Here in this example, we assume it goes from zero euros per megawatt hour on the spot market to 50 euros per megawatt hour on the spot market. And you see in the middle, the spot price is 25 and our profit or loss in the black line here, which goes like this, is exactly zero. Because you, we bought something for 25 and alternatively, we could buy or sell it on the spot market for 25. Doesn't matter whether we buy or sell, whether we bought or didn't buy, price is always 25. If we are on the very right of the spot price range considered here, if the spot turns out to be 50, well then, loosely speaking, we made a pretty good deal. We bought something on the forward for 25, which now on the spot has a value of 50. So we could sell our front year, for example, assume today we buy the front year contract as a forward for 25 years per megawatt hour for the upcoming year. And then we wait, we wait, we wait. At some point, this front year goes into delivery and the spot market again for that product starts. And now we, I think I said we bought forward, we get physical delivery and we could either consume it ourselves or we could sell the electricity on the spot market and we can now what we bought for 50 sell for uh, sorry what we bought for 25 sell for 50 and that is very good deal so our profit obviously is the difference and thus 25. 
while on the other hand, if the spot is very, very weak, in the theoretical extreme year or front year, spot turns out to be zero, well then, paying 25 for something which is now worth zero was not a good idea, so we have a loss of 25 euros. And all the spot prices in between can be analyzed accordingly. So essentially, of course, all spread spot prices above 25, it was good, even ex post, to buy the forward, while for all the spot prices below 25, it was in retrospect not good to buy the forward because we could now have bought cheaper on the spot market. That's the payoff profile. And of course, the forward, both the forward and the future, have the right and the obligation to take the commodity. We can choose or anything, we come back to that later with the options. There you can select if you bought the option, you can select whether you want to exercise or not. But here, of course, for forward and future, you have to take, if you sign the contract, you have to take the product, no matter what. Okay, this concludes section 211, markets and products.